Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Word Balloon, the comic book conversation show. John Suntra is here to close out September. Very excited to present this incredible panel from Terrificon. This was an amazing discussion about one of the most iconic characters whose evolution has gone on with the times and continues to fascinate the comic book reading audience. And he's a sidekick. Of course, I'm talking about Robin, the boy wonder. Today, a discussion about Robin with the men who wrote him. Unbelievable people from the modern era of Pete Tomasi and Tim Seeley doing incredible work on Damien and Dick Grayson. From the 80s, Mike Barr and Jim Starlin. We all know Jim Starlin is the man who killed Jason Todd. And Mike Barr is the man who gave birth to Damian Wayne in the story Batman, Son of the Demon. And a man who's written Batman and Robin from the 60s to today, the legendary Denny O'Neill. I never believed that Robin made any sense in terms of narrative. <laughs> because, first of all, you take when they started back in 1940. An eight-year-old kid, and you're going to put him against a bunch of homo- ar- heavily armed homicidal maniacs. <laughs> not, not good parenting in there. It's a full discussion of all the boy wonders. And yes, the boy wonders. I'm sorry, Stephanie. She's not in the conversation. We had so many panelists and so little time. But an incredible conversation about the evolution and progression of Robin the Boy Wonder from the men who knew him best on today's Word Balloon. This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by the League of Word Balloon listeners. Thank you very much, League, for your support. I am heading to New York Comic Con and partially on your dime. So thank you very much. We're at the end of uh, September, and uh, truly, your contributions via Patreon are greatly appreciated. It helps me keep the equipment up to date and helps me get to cons, making the connections for more great programming here on Word Balloon. I hope you'll uh, continue to subscribe to Patreon. And if you haven't yet, uh, maybe you'll consider it if you can afford it. Word Balloon is free. It'll always be free. And I'm happy to provide this free content. But if you'd like to help the cause, the best way to do it is subscribing via Patreon. You can go to patreon.com slash Word Balloon. Or you can go to wordballoon.com. Click on the Patreon ad. Is is Word Balloon worth a dollar a month? Is it worth the price of a comic book a month? I hope so, and I hope that uh, these hours of comic book conversation are adding to your enjoyment of the culture. This is what I'm trying to do here every week with new episodes of Word Balloon. You can go to patreon.com slash wordballoon or click on the Patreon ad at wordballoon.com. Thank you, as always, League of Word Balloon listeners. This episode of Word Balloon is also sponsored by Aftershock Comics. Shaking things up at your local comic shop right now and at their website, AfterShockComics.com. They have great hit series like Animosity by the wonderful Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour, A Walk Through Hell by Garth Ennis and Goran Suzuka, Baby Teeth with Donny Cates and Gary Brown, as well as exciting new titles like Beyonders by Paul Jenkins and Wesley St. Clair, Hot Lunch Special from Elliot Rayal and Jorge Fornes, and Lollipop Kids, from Adam and Aiden Glass, Adam, of course, his own uh, Robin writer doing t- great work on Teen Titans, his son Aiden, and drawn by Diego Yapur. Check out what's rumbling now with full story descriptions and preview art pages at AfterShockComics.com. I mentioned Lollipop Kids because on the next Word Balloon, you'll be hearing from Adam and Aiden about their book, also what Adam is doing with the Teen Titans these days. But now it's time to talk about Robin with the men who know him best. I mentioned that incredible, illustrative uh, cast of writers we got together. It was one of the last panels at Terrificon, and I was pleased to be able to moderate it and have this hilarious conversation with these wonderful creators whose work we've enjoyed literally from the 60s to today. So let's join our August panel with a discussion of Dick Grayson, Jason Todd, Damian Wayne, Tim Drake, the men who became Robin on Word Balloon. Welcome to the Rock panel, everybody. I am thrilled to be moderating this panel. Yeah. My name is John Suntress. I host a podcast called Word Balloon. It's at wordballoon.com. And I have one-on-one conversations with creators like we have on our panel. But what a great opportunity to really look at the history of Robin with the men behind the, the, the creation, the evolution of not just Dick Grayson, my guy, Jason Todd, Tim Drake, and of course, Damien as well. So I'm going to start at the very end. 
with uh, one of the killers of Robin, <laughs> the man who killed Jason Todd, yeah, the bastard. great game star, ladies and gentlemen. I just tried to get rid of him. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of one of the dynamics of Robin's storytelling. Do we need Robin or not in the stories? But then, of course, uh, Dick Grayson had a great evolution under uh, this man's uh, work in the book Grayson as a super spy. Tim Seeley, everybody. Hello. Thank you. Then a wonderful Batman writer and editor. So what a volume of work, truly. And I'm really excited to talk about various points, including the death of Jason Todd, but even an earlier point as well. But the great Daniel O'Neill is. Another incredible Batman writer. His run on Detective Comics with Alan Davis speaks for itself. As I told, I believe I told Mike this and also uh, Alan, what I loved about it was Batman smiled. When he was writing that, and, and he was certainly more human. Mike Barr, everybody. That's exactly the father of Damien. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah, that's right. So, and then forgive me because uh, he's peering over my shoulder. But uh, another, another Robin Kelly. <laughs> no, I brought him back. You didn't write it up? I brought him back. Okay, that's all right. Excuse me, the resurrection of Damien, but also the great uh, run of Batman and Robin. That was that detective, or was Batman and Robin? Right? Yeah. Batman and Robin, of course, a wonderful Batman writer, a wonderful Superman and Wonder Woman writer as well. Pete Tomasi, everybody. <laughs> so, Dan, I want to start because um, it wasn't, I believe Frank Robbins wrote the story, but, you know, we had about 30 years of Batman and Robin once he finally debuted uh, a couple issues later in Detective Comics and that great Batman issue number one where they're swinging by the ropes. But it seemed by the late 60s, early 70s, and I can't remember the name of the, of the, of the story, maybe somebody in the audience remembers, but when Robin went to Hudson University, and I wonder if you were part of that conversation of maybe it's time for Robin to grow up a bit and, and leave the nest, if you will. Yeah, I don't know. Are we alive? Are yeah. we alive? Yes. I don't know who thought of what back then. I mean, it was... It was a very casual business, and we, I mean, I didn't think the stuff would be remembered a year later, so... Uh, Any of the stories? Yeah, I mean, the conventional wisdom was a comic book's life was a month, and I thought some of the stuff we were doing, I was aware, was pushing the envelope, so I thought three months. <laughs> okay, they've just reprinted... Green Lantern, Green Arrow for like the tenth time in hardcover, <laughs> and it's set. Uh, it is good that I am not a financial advisor. This prophecy thing is uh, <laughs> beyond me. But yeah, I mean, I think about then the business as an entity was beginning to realize these characters should evolve. They are becoming dated, and besides, it's no fun writing the same kind of story month after month. So it might have been Julie's idea to send Dick to Hudson. Uh, I was mostly just a hired hand then. Of course, I was a hired hand who was working for arguably the best editor in comics and certainly a very easy guy to get along with. And a very, very good editor in that his ego never got between him and the work. It was always about the story and never about Julie. Uh, hasn't always been the case. But that's the way to be an editor. Be invisible, but help your creative people. And it's exactly what he did. During the Rise of Wolf Star, I'm trying to remember how many Dick Grayson stories he did because, of course, when you and Neil Adams kind of separated Batman from the 66 series and, and Batman became more serious, was Robin, you know, part of the story and it was fine, easy to work with as a character, or did you want to want to get away from Robin as a character? Well, I think Mike Barr might hit me with a microphone for what I'm about to say, but... Uh, <laughs> Don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> I never believed that Robin 
made any sense in terms of narrative. <laughs> because, first of all, you take, when they started back in 1940, an eight-year-old kid and you're going to put him against a bunch of homo ar heavily armed homicidal maniacs. <laughs> not, not good parenting there. No, we're not going to read it. You said about in primary <laughs> colors while you're hiding in the shadows. <laughs> That's the point. <laughs> The target, absolutely. Hey, you guys are, yeah, you I mean, it's too realistic. Then, if there was any logic to Batman's costume, it was an, a ninja logic. It was dark; he could hide in shadows. So along comes an eight-year-old with bare legs and uh, a bright tunic. Uh, in the same way that I think Batman and Superman don't really ever belong in the same story. Because you got one guy who can probably bench press 450 pounds, and then you've got another guy who juggles planets and yeah. stars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when I heard they were making that movie, I thought, do they have any idea what they're letting themselves in for? <laughs> How difficult it is to put these characters co-starring in something and still maintain story integrity, narrative integrity. The way they solved it was they didn't solve it. <laughs> well, now I feel like I'm in a high school debate, so for a counter-argument, Mike Barr, I, I, you know, we're the usefulness of Robin? I'll, oh. Well, this can't be proven until we discover that parallel world where this never happened, but I have, I have always felt that uh, Robin was a, uh, was uh, one of the basic ingredients to Batman's longevity. I think that if you didn't have Robin in there, that Batman's constant quest for vengeance would have gotten would have gotten a little tiresome after a while, and the reader simply would have stopped reading. Uh, the interesting contrast about Batman is that he's not really he's not really a comic book character in that he's very dark and very vengeance bound, as opposed to say Superman, who's a more optimistic character. Superman is really a comic book character as they conceived of comics back in the 1940s as a kid's medium, and Batman is a little tougher to pull off for kids because he's so because he's so grim. And I think that's I, I think the addition of Robin basically helped that. It's funny because uh, Frank Miller and I used to have a joke about uh, about Robin back in the '80s when you know uh, Batman would say we'd we'd get a call from Commissioner. He, he used to believe that. Uh, uh, Robin was basically, Rob, the Robins got killed almost every case, and Batman would simply recruit more Robins. <laughs> and so, uh, so Batman would get a call from Commissioner Gordon that says, you know, the Joker's taken over the water supply of Gotham City. And Batman would say, that's probably a five Robin job. I'm going to need five <laughs> Robins. <laughs> and you go on, and you go on from there. That's excellent. Yeah, the, my favorite line from the Justice League movie was when. Someone asked Batman what his powers are, and he says, I'm rich. <laughs> That's true. Absolutely. So uh, Robin goes off to college, eventually, you know, abandons the Robin uh, identity, Dick Grayson becomes Nightwing. Uh, there is a new Robin, and, and Denny, before I get to Jim, knocking him off, um, tell us about the, the beginnings of Jason Todd, because... There was an origin, and then am I right, Max Collins then wrote a second origin where he became more of a street kid. I remember he stole the Batmobile tires, and that obviously caught Batman's attention. Yeah, that was, for me as an editor, a learning experience because, yeah, we screw, we, we made mistakes. Now, nobody had ever done what we were doing before, so I, I don't think we ought to wear hair shirts about this, but... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I I carry around a lot of regret for the things that I did wrong when I was professionally involved. And uh, we could have done better with that story. But Jim is uh, the, the Jason Todd expert up here, I would say. Yeah, talk about it. I find that amusing because I spent my entire run on Batman trying to avoid Jason Todd. There you go. You kept forcing me to do uh, stories involving him. Uh, <laughs> you know, we'd do three or four Batman and no Jason and uh, no Robin, and he, then he'd say, you got to put Robin in here eventually. And uh, 
I mean, he worked well inside the cult with the, that we did with Bernie, but I always found him that was a great story. kind yeah. of a, a strange, you know, what we talked about earlier about fighting crime with a teenager and endangerment and all that. Uh, so basically what I was trying to do was avoid him and Denny was pushing him on me and we, Denny eventually came up with the idea, well, we had that, remember the AIDS book they were gonna do up at DC? And they were voting on who was going to do it, and I was trying to get Robin out. I was they, stuff that wanted to give Robin HIV. Oh yeah! Wow! Oh, wow! Hard to do it. Interesting. And, and uh, eventually, what ended up is that Jimmy Olsen was voted to have it. <laughs> oh my God! But then DC found out that the actor who played Jimmy Olsen in the Christopher Reeves movie was gay, and so they abandoned the whole project. Oh wow! Okay, uh, Mike. But, Right, Mark. Mark I, I forget. His Mark was his first name. Mark McClure. Yeah. Mark McClure. Thank you, Mike. Absolutely. And then uh, Great then he came up with the I uh, came up with the idea of the call-in thing, and uh, I had almost given up on lobbying and getting rid of Robin at this point. But uh, <laughs> then he gave it new light, and uh, we went from there. I, I voted to kill Jason Todd. I voted to stay because it was so shocking. I, vo I voted on the 900 number or 800 number to kill Robin because, uh, you know, reading these books, just like when Jerry Conway killed Gwen Stacy, that blew my nine-year-old mind. And I read the reprint, I'm not that old. But still, and it's like, these characters never did really die in comics. I mean, this was before Barry Allen died. So, I mean, yeah, Denny, I mean, was that a, a upstairs? Was this a big... Problem corporately, given Robin's place on birthday cakes, in the candy, greeting cards, and the like. Are there any Time Warner executives in the room? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I don't care. I get my pension. You guys can. Uh, you know, I'm retired. No, we we went. My best editorial tool was getting people together to talk. I believe that, that it, it should be about the story and not about the egos. So if you have a dozen people working, we would try to do six months to a year's continuity. One of the disagreements, are Darren, are you here? Over here, Ben. He's over there. <laughs> over there, yeah. I disagreed with my merry men because they wanted it all tightly plotted, and I wanted to know what the important story beats were, and to leave some room for the, the individual creative people to come up with a better idea, and occasionally they did a much better idea than mine. Uh, so even, even back in the day, then even when, for instance, when I Jim, me, I did well, I did oh, I'm, I'm Darren Vincenzo. I was uh, one of Denny's crew at DC Comics back in the 90s. <laughs> I, uh, I edited uh, Green Arrow. I was the editor of Detective for a while. Uh, I had helped introduce the new Batgirl. The, the, uh, Stephanie? The, uh, yep. yep. Wow. I'm sorry. Or Cassandra. Cassandra. Cassandra King. Yes, that was... Yeah, those guys were so good that... I went to lunch with Paul Levitz after both of us retired. I, Darren and Jordan and Scott and I told Paul a, a year ahead of time exactly when we were quitting to give him all the time he needed to you know hire new people to do whatever. Scott Allen and Scott uh, Peterson. Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson. Scott Peterson. Please. Yep, that was the that was the crew back in the nineties uh, back in the DC books. But I think as what Denny brought up uh, when he was talking about uh, Jason Todd, Denny as an editor has always turned to his entire game team, all of his writers, all of his editorial staff, you know anybody that he could get input in on stories, on characters, on things that were being developed. And I'm sure it was no different when you were the Jason Todd situation. Jim, you probably can, can attest to this. Uh, you know, when it was time to do something with Jason Todd or possibly do something with Jason Todd, you know, Denny would bring in people, he'd talk to the writers, he'd talk to the editors, and, and make some decisions about what he felt, you know, was best for the character. And I guess he came up with this idea to have this 900 number and have people vote, have the fans vote. So. <laughs> More power yeah, can, I, can we circle back to the question that I... <laughs> oh, it was just killing Rob, and I was wondering if the corporate people had... Yeah, let's kill a kid. Um, <laughs> Good background. 
The story did not play as we originally plotted it, because at one of those things at Terrytown, where we used to meet, uh, we had killed Robin, or the, the fans had actually killed Robin. So I thought, they will believe that I'm capable of killing Batman, or we are collectively, because there's a precedent for it. And so, therefore, when he comes back after a year, they're going to sell it 90 jillion copies. Uh, and we will get a challenging story out of it. That was always part of our agenda. I don't know that it still is always, but for us, it was always at some level about the story. So we knew we were taking a chance, and so. At one of these retreats at Terrytown, about every 90 minutes, somebody in the room would call New York and say, "You understand what we're telling you? We're going to—it's we're going to—it's going to look like we've killed Batman, and uh, it's not too late for us to change our mind. We've got all afternoon. We could plot a whole new continuity, but are you sure you understand?" what I'm telling you, and uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, we went ahead with the thing, and then three months later, I am walking through the lobby where DC's uh, headquartered, uh, headquarters were, and an executive stopped me, and the executive kind of said, you, you, you killed Batman, you can't do that. I said, well, well we told you. <laughs> and, and in a year from now, if, no, if you don't read a Batman comic this year and you pick one up in a year, you won't know that anything has changed. Okay. We're going to put all the pieces back in place. But uh, sometimes anybody who's worked in the media, TV particularly, but anywhere knows that sometimes executives don't quite understand what the fuck you're talking about <laughs> in plain English sentences. Uh, so we came up with that, I thought, reasonably lame storyline wherein Bruce Wayne disguises himself as a bloody British uh, detective. That's Nightfall. Okay, and so yeah, that, that was killing Nightfall. Yeah, right, that right. took the right. edge right. off of the Batman story. If we had actually convinced the readership that, yeah, he's dead, it would have been a very profitable thing to do. Also, it would have been interesting for us as storytellers. Mm -hmm. But I was, oh, that was one of three times in 17 years I was overruled. Okay. And my guess is this, it's only a guess, that all those telephone calls we made from Terrytown, I have a pretty good idea of which executive took them, and I don't think she under, she paid any attention to I what I was saying. No, no. <coughs> now, Jim, you mentioned last night that at a different panel, it just kind of came up, you know, casually, that unfortunately for Death and the Family, an epic Batman story that we all remember and love, the death of Robin. I've seen that Jim Aparo panel where, yeah. oh, he's alive, they, yeah, they, they alternate it into Red Hood. Right. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, talk, I mean, talk about your experience writing the story, but also post, uh, post story. Where as opposed to killing Batman, which you were talking about, uh, killing Robin, Obviously, the executives in licensing never found out about it until after the fact. <laughs> because I remember them exploding at us because uh, they had all these damn pajamas and lunch boxes yeah. and stuff like that. Right. And uh, uh, the, by the shakeout of it, at the end, uh, you know, they were pretty pissed off at us, as I recall. And you were left holding the bag, unfortunately. Well, which, I which sort of came, came, came down to that, but you know, uh, but it worked out okay for me because I went over and did the Infinity Gauntlet and there you go. <laughs> So Jim had a happy ending, at least yeah. if Jason Todd didn't have a happy ending. Yeah, um, and uh, I voted for the kid to live. <laughs> uh, Dick Giordano was my boss. Uh, no, I voted 
thumbs down and Dick voted thumbs up. My logic was this. They won't, they, they will dare us. They will see if we're, we're going to go through yeah. with this. <laughs> and uh, Dick thought, no, it would be too ugly. So it was a basic disagreement. So Mary Fran and I were in my office at 10 after 7 one Friday night, and I made the last phone call to the phone company and got the final count and went down and put the the correct panel where it had to be. Wow. And we thought, it's been an interesting experiment. It's over. Wow. Um, the, the rest of my logic was I thought if, if, if it's thumbs down I've got a hell of an editorial problem to solve beginning <laughs> Monday because yeah we're we, we're going to put the pieces back in place sure uh, and I didn't exactly know what that story was could possibly be but uh the problem got solved for me. Uh, my son once directed a movie for HBO, and one of the executives came in and said, don't like Schwimmer's pants. That doesn't work for me. Like, that had nothing at all to do with the movie or anything about it, but this guy felt he had to make a decision, and he didn't have a any idea what a story is, so it's the pants. <laughs> There's, I mean, there were, have been times in comic books where you couldn't have green on a cover or you couldn't have spaceships yeah, yeah. or ray guns because the guys in the big office feel they, they have to make a contribution. Mm-hmm. The problem with that is they are not capable of making a contribution. Right. They're executives in that story. Absolutely. McKee's, sure. uh, Robert McKee's storytelling course, any of you that's, uh, that have taken it are probably aware that a lot of critical type people disagreed with the fact that he was doing that because they said it's going to make everything the same story. It's just, just going to be the same stuff repeated over and over, which is not even remotely true. But it, it's that kind of thinking that very often dominates television. And, well, uh, what I'm talking about is now 10 years out of date because television is our best source of drama. <laughs> That's true. Movies are about explosions. I, Iron Man is going to blow up another f- factory. Uh, <laughs> there's, there's kids in here. Mike, Mike, I think you had a point to make about the, the death of Jason Todd. Well, I wanted to ask, uh, yeah. in terms of... Uh, uh, well, I think the way you, you, you asked how the Warner executives reacted to the death of, of Robin. Yeah. And I wasn't, uh, well, one of the way, ways that you would, I think, adjust to that, possibly, and, and I'm asking here, is if you realize, if you're talking about the merchandising of Robin, it's, it's then you would simply say, well, there will always be a Robin that's just not that same Robin. Not this Robin. So there's a guy who can be, there's a kid who can be on the pajamas and the lunchboxes and the candies and all that. It's just not the same guy, and we'll get some stories out of that. Is that how that worked? Yeah. Um, <laughs> I knew they weren't going to let me eliminate Robin for exactly the reason you just cited. Sure. It was worth millions mm-hmm. every yeah, year. Yeah, merchandising and licensing, that, certainly. But they, I don't know how they could not understand. Look, it, we're going to have Robin. He's going to look exactly like Robin. It's not going to get in the way of your merchandise. It's not going to get in the way of anything. It's just going to give us a story to tell. And you have to be pretty dense not to understand <laughs> that. But somehow they didn't. All right, let's take a short break from the panel and talk about one of our sponsors today, and that's Aftershock Comics. I know you've seen the Aftershock titles on the racks. Have you really opened them up and taken a look at them? This is a publisher that, out of the gate, had top-quality talent, bringing you fresh concepts, beautiful art, and it's no surprise, really, when you think about it. Mike Martz making his bones with the X-Men and the bad office at D.C., 
Joe Pruitt, always a great independent comic book guy, finding incredible new talent at Desperado and Caliber Comics back in the day. They're the brains behind Aftershock, and they've assembled such an incredible group of established pros and newcomers to give you fantastic books. Jimmy's Bastards from Garth Ennis and Russ Braun, one of my favorite spy series that's out there today. Frank Thierry and Oleg Okunev with Pestilence, a very fun story where it turns out the 14th century Black Plague is actually revealed as the first recorded zombie outbreak. Cullen Bunn and Mirko Kolak do a great vampire story, the early years of Vlad the Impaler in the Brothers Dracul. These creators came to Aftershock to tell their kind of stories with no rules, no, no forced continuity. Think about it. Deaths can happen at the drop of a hat. Anything can happen in an Aftershock book. It's a great new platform to tell fresh concepts. Check out these new titles, too, like Hot Lunch Special by Elliot Rael and Jorge Fornes, a great Midwestern noir. Take a look at current conspiracy theories with ties from centuries past in the series Beyonders by Paul Jenkins and Wesley St. Clair. And one of my favorites, a new series starring Leonardo da Vinci, his female apprentice Isabel, and their wooden robot, Monstro Mechanica, from Paul Aller and Chris Evenweiss. That trade is already out this month, and uh, you should definitely check it out. Plus, Lollipop Kids from Adam and Aiden Glass and Diego Yapur. We're going to be getting into detail in that on the next Word Balloon episode with a talk from Adam and Aiden, as well as an excellent talk by Howard Chaikin. So check it out. That's in the next episode, but you don't have to wait. Go to their website. You'll find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes on these books to order them through your local comic shop at AfterShotComics.com. All right, let's get back to our Robin conversation now on Word Balloon. And Marv wrote the Tim Drake story that introduced Tim, and suddenly Tim, Tim almost became... Your guy's point of view of, of course, Batman needs a and Robin. He was and this a, isn't right. He was a very much improved version of Robin, I thought. And I give complete credit to Jim Starlin and Marvin Wolfman because that was not an easy editorial problem to solve, and they solved it beautifully. They, they, we ended up with a better character than what we started. I didn't do anything. I caused okay. a problem. I didn't help. But yeah, unfortunately. Marv did the new, new, the new guy. The Tim Drake. Around. Yeah, I wasn't around. Okay, yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, as, as Jim said earlier, you know, someone had to take the blame for killing Robin. Denny was one of the big editors and stuff, but I think that poor Jim had uh, was left holding the bag. So, But again, it worked out good because yeah, yeah. went to Marvel, Infinity Gauntlet, and I think that's worked out nicely for Jim if we've watched movies recently. So that's okay. But, um, yeah, Tim Drake obviously has become an, an interesting Robin and, and is, is still now in, in the books and everything. But uh, we also, Mike, you uh, come up with the Son of the Demon <laughs> and the Birth of Damien, and that had to be a controversial uh. Please, yeah, uh, I, uh, you know. Yeah, yeah, you really have no idea uh, what it was like, but uh, because because I had said to, to to DC, well, actually, the story itself, you know, the, the idea was that, that that Batman and Talia would 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 have this have this child, and then during the course of the of the story, after some action, where where, where, where Talia is is actually slapped around some, she would t- t- tell Batman that she had lost the baby. And at that point, you think, okay, fine, then yeah, we just go back to business as usual. Right. But then you realize at the end of the story that Talia is actually lying because she's afraid that having this knowing having this child around is going to take the edge off of Batman. He's going to get killed. So I'll tell him that there is no child, and that'll be fine. And you know, and I uh, and I figured you know they they would do with it what they would, but they but again, people didn't seem to realize that we had done something that could be undone. It was sort of like, what had you done? What have you done? And I said, well, basically, you know, you forget that it wasn't my, I mean, I, I, mean, I wrote the story, but I didn't do it on my own. I didn't draw the story. I didn't love the story. I didn't sneak the artwork into the printing plant <laughs> and, 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 and put it on my own and distribute it. Everybody knew what I was doing. Everybody knew what we, what we were doing, actually. So I was a little surprised at the furor that the story had 
created. And this was after Dark Knight Returns, Frank Miller's story had come out, correct? Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. so, yes. Yes. so yeah, well, an, a, a more adult yeah. telling of Batman stories had already been established, mm-hmm. and I don't know if initially was it supposed to be in continuity, or was it supposed... I mean, this was pre-Elseworlds with, as with well. Dark, with Dark Knight Returns? With Son of the Demon. Oh, oh. So well, how, how did, how did uh, DC... Was, 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 we kind of was the Son of... Was your story about Damien and, and Batman oh. and Talia getting down? Oh. Was that, uh, if you will, uh, you know, was that was that okay? Because again, they they you know, was it going to be an incongruity? Because I remember reading in fan magazines mm-hmm. that it's like, oh no no, don't worry, this is this is out of continuity. Well, that's what I thought too. But I, I basically said to Dick Giordano, who's the Batman editor at that time, who was the editor of the of the, of that graphic novel. You know, Dick, you realize what we're doing here? And Dick said, yes, yeah, sure, there's no problem. Maybe, was it uh, maybe Dick or, or Len? Oh, was it? Well, let's see. I thought it was. Well, maybe it was. Not, was, was Len was the Batman the editor? No. Okay. Okay. All right. I came in when the editorial work was all done on that. No, y- yeah. I, didn't, I didn't touch it. No, okay. no that's, that's true. Yeah, that's true. But I think you were the editor when the book was published. Yeah. Yeah, that's ah, right. Because that okay. was after uh, Alan and I had done Detective. So sure. So yeah. So. Uh, uh, we, I didn't really know whether they were going to incorporate the story into the bigger continuity or not, and uh, I and, and and first for years it was it was absolutely verboten to even speak of it, and now all of a sudden you know Damian Wayne is everywhere. Well, yeah, and Pete, this is a good opportunity to talk a bit about Damian Wayne. My and problem with it was that, it. that meant that neither Batman or Talia were virgins and. Listen, I'm a Catholic. I mean, I, I have my standards. <laughs> well, that's the thing, and it really was this great standalone story, Son of the Demon, that we all loved as Batman fans. And then, Pete, what happened in terms of bringing him forward and really deciding, hey... Well, let's... I was an editorial at that time. It was so, Grant, Well, Grant brought him back, I, Grant Morrison. And I hired Grant to write Batman, so... Um, Grant, obviously, you know, one of the first things he said was, let me check out the Son of the Demon, and because he wanted to bring a kid into this, a new Robin, so which he did. And uh, then just over time, he, he always initially, he was going to kill Robin right off the bat. It was just a question, uh, not if, but when. So um, he just kind of <laughs> kept it going and going for a while. And then I actually ended up going freelance at that point. And uh, then he was like, yeah, I want to, and I got the book, Batman and Robin, and then he goes, I want to kill Robin. I'm like, oh, good. I got a book, Batman and Robin, and they're going to kill him. <laughs> but, um, but I was able to really play with Damien and really add a lot of layers to him um, as, I, as I went on and, uh, and then explore, I think for the first time, what really, I mean, even though there's some really great stories in the past, took take a lot of time to explore the grief of it, the real, you know, what it, what it cost him emotionally and psychologically. Losing Damien. Losing Damien as his son, and especially, you know, you know, born of his, from his blood, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, so that hadn't been done in a lot of, some people were like, well, I mean, it should be a month later. Wow, why isn't he over it already? And I was like, you know, let's, let's really, let's, let's dig into it. And so I went into the five stages of grief and obviously these other DCU heroes, you know, to, uh, to explore it with Batman and such. And, uh, you know, went from the streets of Gotham, you know, to the depths of, you know, everywhere in the D.C. that I could go. And then, of course, went to, you know, the streets of Gotham to the streets of Armageddon on, on Apocalypse. So it was a real cool way to just blow out Batman. Because I, what I love about Batman, which, you know, a lot of guys have said, of course, who've written him, is that, you know, he fits every genre in my head. So, you know, even though, you know, you can sometimes say, I know Danny was like, you know, I know Danny hated him in space and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> But I, but I thought that emotional, that emotional through line for him, you know, worked when he went to get his son to, to, to the ends of the earth and beyond. You know, what you see up here going on now in real time is the editorial process because while we're all being polite, we obviously disagree. Absolutely. And what Levitt said was, it's their turn now. Sure. Uh, um, it may be heresy, but I, I'm saying that there is no right or wrong. Absolutely. Mike and I have some fundamental disagreements about this stuff, and we, we work together fine. Uh, I have fairly radical disagreements with Frank Miller, but I wouldn't have any problem working with him tomorrow. It's 
the, the stuff has to evolve. And the mistake that the executives made for years and years is not believing that. Well, and that's the beauty of the indestructibility of the character, because as Pete says, he can fit in various genres, but also the very things that you felt was wrong with having an eight-year-old fighting crime, here comes Damien, eight-year-old ninja, yeah. that knows how to kill you 25 different ways with a paperclip. Right. You know, I mean, and that's, and again, it's, it's extreme, but it's interesting, it, it builds new story and new story opportunities. And Tim, I want to get you in there, because as the Batman universe evolved, we also reached another point where it's time to kill a Robin again. Man, Dan DeDio must hate Robin. Well, I mean, then, the thing over the years, really, I mean, even before, <laughs> yeah. you know, uh, for, I forget me which crisis was it that killed him. He just hates Dick Grayson. Well, there you go. I don't get it. I don't understand Dick Grayson was the All right. But of course, all of us are like, Dick Grayson was our Robin. You know, Dick Grayson really, a lot of us, you know, he was the wish fulfillment, even as he got older and was allowed to get older and stuff. And so um, he is presumed dead in Final Crisis? No. I don't even remember. I don't remember either. <laughs> I had oh, a Forever big Evil. That was it. It was Forever Evil. Oil painting by Dick Sprang hanging in my office at home. And listen, that's that was published when I was six. That's the real Batman. <laughs> I agree. Dick, Dick Sprang is an amazing Batman artist. But Grayson, so we get the evolution. He's pre- it's just like the uh, opening of The Incredible Hulk. Dick Grayson is presumed to be dead, but he must let the world go on believing that he is dead so he can become a super spy named Grayson. <laughs> I mean, to me, it's always interesting to talk about the Robin stuff and not point out the most important thing about Robin is that it's hard for older people to understand the appeal because they see a bright color in a kid. And it's actually, Robin is you as a reader coming in to get to hang out with Batman. So Robin is more important than Batman, actually, because he's the entry point, the kid, who comes in and says, man, if I could just hang out with Batman, that'd be so cool. And you get Robin. And that's why Robin, I mean, I'm sure the majority of the people in these rooms, one of the first characters they ever, you know, gravitated toward was Robin. Whether he was in Teen Titans Go, or the Batman animated series, or in the comic, or maybe in the Joel Schumacher movies, I doubt it, but maybe. <laughs> um, but the, the character is so fundamentally important to the the, the mythos and the, and the longevity of Batman that I think there's a cynicism that comes with us when we get a little bit uh, along in the, in the career and we were like, oh, I just want to get rid of, 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 my, of Robin. And you're wrong. You shouldn't get rid of Robin. He's really important to, to the character. So, you know, for me, going to work on Dick Grayson, it's like, okay, I have to figure out why this character sticks around. And it's the thing is, he has the opposite attitude of Batman, right? He had a terrible thing happen to him, and he had someone there to catch him. And Batman did it. So Batman became his way, and Robin became Nightwing, a cool guy who just wants to help people. And have fun doing it. And I'm speaking to Jeff Johns in his counter-argument to Dan DeDio, and he said this on the podcast. It's like everybody loves Dick Grayson, the guy. The, The rest of the DC Universe loves Dick Grayson. He's like the best friend to everyone, the Titans, the Justice League, because he's the happy guy. Well, he's also the guy they hung out with when he was a cool kid. Well, yeah. So they, they've seen him grow up. They, you know, they're yes. just like you as a reader. Yep. You watched Dick grow up. No matter which version you, you saw, he started out as a kid and he became a teenager in your lifetime. Uh, so that the DC Universe character is the same way. It's like your buddy's kid. You, hey, man, it's good to see you. Like You're happy to see your buddy's kid, you know? But the medium has evolved in such a way that one of your questions gets answered. Yeah, we bring back Robin, but uh, we don't have Robin, and let's make him an eight-year-old Robin, but let's give a story reason why that is the baddest-ass eight-year-old kid <laughs> Absolutely. on the East Coast. Yeah. Uh, in the early comics, nobody was really thinking about characters. Most of those guys were refugees from the Pulps. And in Pulps, plot was king. Uh, Stan may have been the first to uh, comic book guy to really see the, the entertainment value in logical plots. And his weren't terribly logical always. <laughs> but uh, you, you brought him back, but you didn't bring him back as this naive little right. he was, school he, kid. Yeah, he was well-versed in the, 
in the artist of death. And he was a well-rounded individual, and like we showed a, a double-page spread. I mean, Talia taught him the ninja arts, but then he was also learning from top teachers in music. And so he was a pure Renaissance kid in a way. And but he was as deadly as you could go, and you believe him as he was out there on the streets that Batman for the first time could have a kid at that age with him. And of course, we toned down the. the there were no more shorts, so that helped. So that helped. Yeah, thank God. You <laughs> but no, the character like you were getting into, it was key in Stan. Well, I mean, there was. I mean, really the first death for me when I was reading, the first thing that shocked me as a kid was when Captain Stacy died in uh, of course. Amazing Spider-Man. When that happened, that was like, wow, okay, this stuff is really, you know, it can grab you at any time and you can get something taken away from you. So it was, uh, that was for me, and then of course leading to Gwen, but, and then the uh, million Robins, but... Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it was, uh, the character is king for me, as I know when I write, and especially Robin. Well, I want to open up, and forgive me, but I, you know, I really want to hear everyone's perceptions of the various Robins that they work with. So if people do have questions, I'd love to open the floor. Sir. Speak. Uh, did you ever get any feedback from Jerry Robinson about the different evolutions of Robin through the years? Jerry Robinson feedback from the various evolutions. Had you ever heard Jerry's opinion? No, I got to be pretty close to Jerry toward the end of his life. We were uh, always friendly acquaintances. Uh, we became friends at the end and we never talked shop. Jerry was a Renaissance man in his own way. And so, yeah, we talked politics and current events and things like that. I don't think those, those early guys, with the exception of people like Eisner, would not have copped to it being an art form. And they, they really didn't see any need to think about it too much. They even had a separate word for it. The science fiction writers, I don't remember what it is. It's in one of Alfred Bester's essay collections. Oh, wow. So, I mean, it was their way of saying, well, this isn't really science fiction. They're just grinding it out. They were earning a paycheck, basically. Yeah, we had once asked the guy who ghosted the stuff that got stopped, uh, signed Bob Kane, Shelley Mayer. Uh, Shelley Moldoff. Shelley Moldoff, yes. yeah. And uh, he said, Bob, I had a family, Bob's checks didn't bounce. <laughs> End of story. Understood. Absolutely. Yeah, man. I mean, that's that is kind of the, the reality. Sorry, the front. And then you. Um, it's Stalin. So the votes come in, and the fan vote to keep Jason Todd alive. How would you handle the story afterwards? Who the alternate ending? If if no, yeah, if, if Jason Todd is lived, if they said we like him out and just keep him around, what would you have done? I would have gone back to try and figure out stories that I didn't have left him on. <laughs> I'll be honest about it. <laughs> That's great, though, Jim, honestly. And it's a, it's a legit, again, this is the thing. And Denny would have kept pushing me into doing more. But again, they brought, that, they brought that into the comics. It is, does Batman need a Robin? And again, that became the reason for, for Tim Drake. And that guy saying, absolutely, it does. Dick, get back with Batman. And it's like, no, I've got my own life now. And of course, that gave him the entree to become the next Robin. Sir. Robins have been killed in pretty violent, graphic manners over the years. <laughs> it's so weird that this panel degenerated just murder talk. It's so weird. <laughs> it's, the kill it's, like, it's like the happy, bright colored character of DC, Murdering and all you guys want to talk about is murder. <laughs> <laughs> it's so screwed up. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, the. Yes, we're being discussed and plotted out. Were there more kind and, and less painful manners? Never. No, we're going. No, it was, I mean, with, with Grant, I mean, it was always going to be a pretty brutal death um, for Damien, but we knew, I mean, you know, we knew we were going to bring him back, and the thing was, they wanted to, Grant wanted to wait probably closer to five years, I, I pulled more for the year, year and a few months, I thought it was, you know, it'd be too long a wait for Damien to be gone. Well, and it was great, I remember Grant saying in that great Scottish accent, you're going to love him? And then you're going to cry as soon as I kill him. <laughs> so, you know, who's, uh, who's next, sir? And then the lady. So, Robin has been through quite a few stories, both with Batman on his own, as Nightwing, Tim Drake, you know, Grayson, with the Teen Titans. I just want to wonder which 
version, which story do you think Robin had a chance to best shine on his own outside of Batman's shadow? Probably what Pete's been doing are those guys. Yeah, I think we really let Damien even, I mean, it's, it was, it's called Batman and Robin, but I do think I let Robin sort of take center stage to a degree in that book and really wanted to, you know, layer it out. And it was perfect timing for me because my son was at that age when the New 52 started with it. So I was pulling a lot from our relationship, his, his, uh, his uh, angel and devil side, incorporating, you know, incorporating into uh, the book. Like even a small, I mean, that's the best thing about it. For me, as being a writer, is you know, you look in the garage and you see your son, you know, hold your his, my boot against his boot, and in my head, you, know, you never, you never stop writing. I'm like, oh, he can do that. He can do that in the back cave with Batman's boot, and you know, just small moments like that inform the character. So it was really key for me to make Robin, um, after everything he'd been done, been done to him, to really feel like a flesh and blood three dimensional character. Very cool. Later. Uh, uh, the whole table. Uh, what is your favorite Robin story? Oh, yeah, all right, yeah, down the, down the road. Right? Your favorite Robin story. And I'll, I'll be interested to hear Mike and, uh, and Jim's, uh, Jim's reaction to that, but we'll start with me. Start that one. Okay. Yeah. Jim, do you have a favorite Robin story? Was there ever, as a reader even, or a writer, a, a favorite Robin story? I, I don't remember one that really stood out for me. Okay. I, I mean, I, I like a lot of Batman and Robin stories, but uh, I, I can't at this point bring something to mind. Well, I like yours, Hunting Down. <laughs> I hunting bet he down, does. I bet hunting Down, yeah, Joker, sure. as well. I mean, your, your own story in Killing Him was a great Jason story of revenge, and that really informs the character subsequently, even now as the Red Hood of defying Batman. What so I'm, I would, you know. What I'm kind of curious is, after you killed so many Robins, where are you finding anybody who's willing to become an extra? <laughs> that seems like job? a really, uh, 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 only the, the most maladjusted person would take that job. <laughs> God, you're so sick. Um, uh, I mean, there's lots of stuff uh, with Robin. I think the, uh, the first Tim Drake stories, when he was first introduced, was at the perfect time for me. I was a teenager. Um, and, you know, this character who comes into it and approaches it without vengeance or anger. He's just someone who's inherently good. I love that stuff. Um, a lot of the Dick Grayson Teen Titans stuff is fantastic. Um, I think some of the stuff we pulled off in Grayson is, is pretty good for the Dick Grayson character. It's pretty good for Robin. Uh, I think there's a good Robin story. Danny, did you have a favorite or ever or Robin story? Well, there's... Uh, two ways to look at this. Mike mentioned one of them. Uh, Robin has provided, in effect, comic relief. He lightens things up a little bit. The other side is it's not logical to have him in the story. And I could argue either side. Uh, as a writer, I kind of found him to be a pain in the butt. Uh, because when I started, there it was understood there had to be a Robin in a Batman story. Sometimes he didn't belong there. Now, as the medium and my relationship with Julie Schwartz evolved, I didn't have to do that anymore. And I think as bits of narrative, the stories were improved. So I, I, I mean. Robin was a necessary evil for me, but I never believed that I was the boss of DC Comics. I basically did what they told me to do, unless it crossed some kind of private moral line. I would not write a story glorifying war, though there were plenty of them written. Uh, I had some problem with romance stories, not from any a sense of moral outrage, but because they were kind of lame stories. Okay. Uh, <laughs> if it was a given that there was going to be Robin if there was a Batman, and okay, we can make it work. You roll with it, I understand. Mike, mm -hmm. favorite uh, Robin stories? Uh, I, there's a story from 
1963 or maybe early 64, the very end of Jack Schiff's run uh, on Batman called uh, Robin Dies at Dawn. That's a good one. Which, yeah. is one, of the, which is one of the more, uh, which is one of the more famous stories from that era, in which the old, although it looks like a science, it looks like one of the wacky science fiction stories. Originally, it actually resolves itself into a more or less naturalistic uh, 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 situations and ex- explodes the relationship between Batman and Robin. I remember it well. I've read it absolutely. Um, you know, sorry, I can't think of a story per se, but actually, with Mike, with Mike sitting next to me, I think I like really just the exuberance and the. The dynamic dual aspect of Mike's Batman and Robin stories. There's just so much life to them together. That was important when I was reading. That's awesome. And Alan drew one of the best Robins ever shown. And his, he, was, he was like a teenager. He was always moving and he was yeah. oh, yeah. you know, he's really energetic. Yeah. It's great. Well, that's a th- again, there was this positivity about your run on Batman always. Yeah, well, that, that basically, uh, I don't know if I can take any credit for that per se. I was just trying to do in more or less terms of modern comics in those days what Bill Finger and Bob Kane and Dick Sprang and Jim Mooney and all those guys had done back then was just to explore the relationship of Batman and Robin, which was Batman and Robin is this, either, son, either are they big brother and little brother, are they father and son, are they uncle and nephew, well there, there may be all of those in that one of them has to be in that, uh, you know, one of them is in charge and one of them, and one of them follows the orders. And, but, but, but but Robin is able to take initiative on his own when he has to. And, and uh, two towards that initiative, I'm just going to throw in mind, not the U.S., but the Olsen and Robin team that used to show up in World's Finals oh. back in the Silver Age. Again, as a kid, I love those stories because it was the two sidekicks getting together and doing their own thing. So we've got I tried to pitch a sequel to that in Gracie where he has to team up spy and reporter. I thought that was better. Like, oh, she got shot down. Too, oh, too, too happy with Benesi. Yeah. Jimmy is not, <laughs> and I'm hoping Bendis will uh, put Jimmy back where he belongs as far as providence. But uh, we got about five minutes left. Any other uh, questions? Sir? Yes, for my daughter. She likes Team Titans Go. Absolutely. And I'm a therapist, and uh, Team Titans Go Robin is so erotic. I feel like treating <laughs> What story have you guys ever written that would show the vulnerability of a Robin, the anxiety, um, where he's not so composed, where he's not so um, together? Is there any story? Are all the characters on Teen Titans Go neurotic? Really? <laughs> Just, <laughs> despite his bravado, Pete, would you say that's one of Damien's weaknesses, that is that he doesn't really, as, as evolved as he is, you know, obviously he's still a 10 year old kid. Yeah, that's so, the best thing about Damien is he you can write him as Killer Ninja at the same time. You know, he's still just a kid. And I think, I mean, if you, I, anywhere in that Batman and Robin run, we do that. I, I never just let that take center stage. I always go in to show that he's a kid and, you know, dealing with a lot of stuff. So most of that run has a lot of that in there about just the self doubt and also uh, just the sadness of his mother treating him the way she does and stuff like that. So that's, that's all in there. Mike? Uh, I suppose my favorite story in that category is the uh, is an issue of Detective Comics that Alan Davis and I did where they fought the Scarecrow, and is, and, it, and it's revealed that uh, basically Robin, or in this case Jason, one of his biggest fears is failing Batman. Uh, he's he's uh, t- t- terrified that he's not going to be able that he's never going to be good enough to to and to to accept the role, and that some crucial point in Batman's life is at stake. Jason will fail him. Excellent. Kind of the way I feel about Neil Adams. I, I will never be good enough to. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That Mike story is the one I would recommend. That's a, that's a great story. And again, it's Alan Davis, so it looks beautiful. And uh, that was when Scarecrow was really creepy, and he doesn't look like he should be able. He's like a you know twigs holding up a sack. It's great. It's, it's a really good story. And again, Jim just wants. <laughs> And my own personal thing, I, didn't we do a story where we left it where Robin may or may not have murdered some guy at the end of the story? Uh, yes, <laughs> right before the death of the family. Absolutely, Jim, I remember that story very well. And it was that kind of smug, satisfied, again, playing right into who Jason Todd is and everything, that I know what I'm doing, but obviously showing his frailty. I think that's great. Good call. Sure. Yeah, I remember that story very well. That was good. Dude, great run, man. Absolutely. I'm, I'm glad that things went great and stuff in terms of going back to Marvel Cosmic for you. But yeah, it's, it's a shame because Jim, Jim had a hell of a run on Batman. So yeah, I was, I was one of those people like, where did Starling go? 
the hell happened? He said so, he under the table. Yeah. <laughs> uh, probably time for one fast question, but it's got to be a lightning question. So anybody? And if that will wrap up. Nobody. All right. You know, seriously, an excellent conversation about the evolution of Robin by uh, the men that uh, know him best. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, panel, for a great conversation. So there you go, the Robin panel from Terrificon last month at Mohegan Sun in Connecticut. Thanks again to uh, my host, Mitch uh, Halleck, for letting me come out there, moderating these incredible panels. There's still two left, two incredible conversations. The Venom panel that I had with Dave Michelini, and perfect timing for that. You will hear that uh, the weekend of Venom's opening, so this coming weekend on Word Balloon. Expect that while I'm out at New York Comic Con. We also have the Superman at 80 panel coming for you with Roger Stern, Paul Kupperberg, Pete Tomasi is back. It's a great conversation about Superman with the men who know him best. So those two great conversations from Terrificon still to come here at Word Balloon. A postscript on this Robin panel. Tim Seeley and I were, were on the plane back uh, from Mohegan Sun to Chicago and I'm like, that was a fantastic panel. I had a ball. He goes, yeah, you had a ball. There's a bunch of eight-year-old kids there in Robin costumes listening to a bunch of old men complain about how they hate Robin. And immediately I went to my eight-year-old voice and said, but I like Robin. Uh, you know, what can I say? I, I, uh, I play to the masses. And uh, that's okay. They had their moms and dads there to say, that's okay. They like Robin. They're just teasing. But uh, it was a lot of fun. And I, and I can't deny I enjoyed it as you can hear from my uh, laughter, which was absolutely genuine throughout that panel. Those guys are fantastic. And I look forward to upcoming longer conversations. We'll give Denny a rest. Man, what a trooper, man. Uh, on so many Word Balloon episodes this year, I'm not going to bother him till 2019. But uh, would love to have a long conversation with Mike Barr. Uh, Pete Tomasi, finally, I get T Pete Tomasi on Word Balloon. He's been eluding me. Him and C.B. Sobolski. Those are my two big ones that I had to get in their face and go, see, you're going to be on Word Balloon, like it or not. And they're good guys. I love Pete. Uh, he's terrific. And uh, also, I want to talk to uh, Denny's editorial assistant. I got his information. And there's a guy who's a keeper of a lot of 90s DC stories. So we'll get him on as well. No, it was really terrific at Terrificon, hence the name. And I'm happy to bring all this stuff to you this year on Word Balloon. And man, I, I hope I'm invited back next year because I have a feeling there's going to be a lot more great conversations in uh, the months ahead at the next Terrificon. Right now, my focus is on New York Comic Con. I will be there. No panels, just wandering around, uh, as I always like to say, running for mayor at the conventions, saying hi to the creators, saying hi to the fans. I don't have a table. Uh, you might find me if you go visit my buddies from Aya oh yeah Comics, uh, Art and Franco, and Scoot McMahon. They are in Section B of Artist Alley. And uh, when I'm too tired to walk around and I just want to get off my feet, I'll likely be hanging with them. Uh, I'll be there late afternoon on Thursday through Saturday at New York Comic Con. I won't be there on Sunday. I have some other uh, commitments in the city that I have to keep. But I'm really looking forward to being there and saying hi to everybody and thanking you personally for listening to Word Balloon. This episode of Word Balloon is brought to you by Aftershock Comics. Shaking things up at your local comic shop right now. We've told you about their great titles, man. Animosity for Marguerite Bennett and Raphael De La Tour. Baby Teeth with Donny Cates and Gary Brown. A Walk Through Hell from Garth Ennis and Gorn Suzuka. And Lollipop Kids from Adam and Aiden Glass doing the writing. Diego Yapur doing the drawing. They're coming up on the next episode of Word Balloon. I can't wait to share this conversation with you, along with another great guy. It's a double feature. You might have heard of him, Howard Chaikin. Always great to have Howard back. And uh, Hey Kids Comics, his new image series, is just fantastic and an excellent history about the comic book business. So do yourself a favor. There are great Aftershock comics in every genre, from superhero to spy, steampunk, war comics, you name it, they've got them for you. You can find full story descriptions, preview pages, and the diamond codes to order these books through your local comic shop at AfterShockComics.com. Thanks again for listening to Word Balloon. Thank you again, League of Word Balloon listeners, for your support through Patreon. If you want to subscribe to Word Balloon, WordBalloon.com. Click on the Patreon ad there on our front page or go to Patreon.com slash WordBalloon. Thanks. More great episodes coming in October. Fast and Furious, a couple episodes right before New York Comic Con. Can't wait to share them for you. 
Can't wait to share them with you later this week. Thanks for your patience. It was a little under the weather this past week, but that's why I'm back this weekend with a new episode and uh, doubling down with more great stuff in our first couple days of October. Until next time, Word Balloon is a copyright feature of Shaky Productions, copyright 2018.